Luke chapter 15, walking with Jesus through the Gospels, and we are in Perea. Jesus has been at the home of one of the rulers of the Pharisees, so that was back in chapter 14. A lot of interaction taking place, and then he has left that house, and uh, there are, if you look at verse uh, 20, 25, a great crowd or great crowds accompanied him and he turned to speak to them and uh, continues on from that point. So that's where we are picking it up in that context here in chapter 15, looking at verses 1 through 3. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man received sinners to eat with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. And so it continues on from that point, and I didn't want, I'm not cutting this off from the parable intentionally, but I want to have that concept and awareness that he's speaking a parable to them in uh, this setting. And we've looked at the parable last week. We'll, we will uh, skim through this parable, at least the first two elements of it, and then we're going to be camping our time on the third element of this parable. So what I want us to be aware of is the audience to which Jesus is, is speaking. Now the crowds have gathered together. We just mentioned that. He turns and speaks to them. And then we read with the crowds that are still gathered that uh, the tax collectors and the sinners have gathered together and the Pharisees are upset. The scribes and the Pharisees are upset. They are grumbling against Jesus, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. So they, th this is more than just a comment. They are like they've headed up to here with his antics. That's how they look at it. Why is that? Any idea? The Pharisees are looking at the tax collectors and the sinners. Sinners was a, a, um, a, a figure of speech to refer to the low of the low. So you've got tax collectors that are in, in one camp. And why were they so low? Why were they considered to be you know, the bottom of the barrel? They worked for Rome, all right, so uh, so did the um, servants of, of Herod's household, and, and lots of people worked for Rome. What was so upsetting about these tax collectors? They cheated people out okay. of money. They cheated people out of money. Romans, the soldiers did that too. Mm -hmm. You're right, I'm not, I'm not calling, mm -hmm. calling it wrong, but why are they speaking against the tax collectors specifically? What was it about the tax collectors working for Rome that so um, upset the Pharisees. You're probably already thinking about it because you may be already aware of it and not even thinking about it as being something unique, but it's this. Who were the tax collectors? They were Jews. They were Jews. So that meant that the rest of the Jewish population viewed tax collectors as traitors. See, it wasn't just that they were tax collectors. Uh, how many of you would like to have a cousin or a, a brother-in-law or something like that who worked for uh, Revenue Canada and he's, he or she's the one responsible for collecting your taxes? Anybody? You look at that person as being shady or corrupt or crooked? They could be. <laughs> they could be, but not necessarily. You don't look at them as being corrupt, right? It's not that they were collecting taxes that was the, the biggest part of the problem. Although, as far as they were concerned, like don't have anything to do with, with the Romans. But their, their beef with this was that the, the, they would have a jurisdiction. They would put in bids, these tax collectors. They would put a bid in on a, an area or a region that was open. So say, say somebody is retiring. A tax collector is retiring, so now you're going to have other people that want to come into his um, business 
and put in bids or tenders hoping that they can get uh, that business. And what they would do is they would say, this is how much I will ensure that you get from this province or region or county, that sort of thing. And then they would exact more money than what was necessary from the, their fellow citizens and pocket that change. So this was one of the issues with Zacchaeus, and we'll see that situation when we come to uh, Luke chapter 19. He wasn't just a tax collector, he was what kind of a tax collector? A leader, a chief tax collector. Yeah, so I mean, he was, I mean, if tax collectors were bad, uh, Zacchaeus was really, really, really bad as far as the Jews were concerned. So one, they're collecting taxes from their, th this imposter state as far as the Jews were concerned. Secondly, they are usurping money from them. So they're taking more. And how were they capable of doing that? Because they were assigned Roman soldiers to guard the, um, the tax collectors, guard his tax booth, and so on. So this was, uh, it's like the mafia almost in a sense. All right, so that was one aspect, was the tax collectors. And the other, the other grouping is sinners. What, what's that? Who are they? You might think that they're Gentiles, but most likely not. They're, collect, they're gathered in that, but who is the ones that are living in the land of Israel, more so that they're interacting with? It's the, they're the Jewish people. So the Jews uh, that didn't keep the law... Jews that seem to be more disregarding of the law than others, like prostitutes, um, like the ones that were like the low of the low of the low. So you've got them, and then you've got in another group, but just as low, the tax collectors. In the Pharisees' eyes. So in the Pharisees' eyes. This is the Pharisees' eyes, all right? But because it's in the Pharisees' eyes, guess who else's eyes it's in as well? the general population of the Jewish God-fearing people. Why? Because the Pharisees were the ones who were the leaders or the religious leaders of the nation. They were the ones that uh, they took what the scribes were experts in, the, teacher, the, the lawyers, the experts in the law, the scribes, they were responsible for making copies. They were recording and copying the scriptures on a daily basis, and they were, um, because of that, nobody knew the Scriptures better than they did so far as what it said. There's a difference between knowing what the Scripture says and having what the Scripture says impact your heart and your, your mind. All right? Big difference. So the scribes, at, at length, at this point in time, are those who are experts in the Word of God as far as what it says, but not in how it impacts the heart and the life. And what they're more of an expert in that the Pharisees are concerned about is not the written law, but as we've seen so many times, what law? The oral law. Difference is? What are the differences between the two? Well, the oral law is your tradition more is, than it is. So their tradition more than the Word of God. So let's look at the Word of God, what the, the, the law, so that would be the Tanakh, the, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. So the Hebrew Scriptures. That was what was given to the people by the prophets, by Moses, um, by uh, David, Isaiah, Samuel, so on and so forth. It was the written record, the inspired Word of God. The oral law is the tradition, but it was also what they considered to have had been given to Moses on the mountain of Mount Sinai that was not written down. And then they just uh, developed that in their minds. It didn't exist. It wasn't a reality. It's what they invented as a concept that there was this oral law, and it became uh, tradition, and then it was something that was passed on orally from about the time uh, just after the exile in Babylon. So coming after their return to Israel, they started 
writing down this oral tradition. And it became more uh, impacting and authoritative than the written law was. So this is where they are at this point. The scribes, remember this, when Jesus said to the Pharisees, woe to you Pharisees, hypocrites, and so on. Three woes back in chapter 10, I think it was, or 11 of Luke. And then the scribes said, you, when you say this to the Pharisees, you offend us also. Why? Because if he's generally bringing a woe against the Pharisees, he's specifically bringing it against the scribes because the Pharisees are getting it from the scribes. So this is why uh, the Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling that he is receiving, he's accepting the tax collectors and sinners. And what's more, he's not just receiving them, but he's eating with them. Somebody in that culture, that society, is, eats together, it's essentially saying we're, we're coming into relationship, protection. Um, it could be a business agreement. It could be any number of things, but you didn't eat with your enemy. And when you ate with somebody who was a stranger, they came into your house or under your tent, under your roof, and they came under your protection. And you were essentially um, pledging your resources to and for them. This is a big deal, right? So they can't see why is he doing this for, for these sinners and tax collectors. All right. Uh, I want us to be aware of something, and I'm making a bit of a mess. Can you get me a Kleenex? <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of get this idea. Have you ever seen somebody chewing on the end of a, of a pen in a class or something like that, and then all of a sudden um, they're like, Oh, <laughs> and <laughs> realizing that they broke through to the uh, the, the, the ink <laughs> compartment. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, what? That's speaking from experience. Well, that, that did happen to me once, yes. Uh, when it happens once, you, <laughs> you attempt to make it not happen again. So uh, I'll try not to let this happen again. So, All right, so let's look at the first words, the first sentence that's here in chapter 15 and verse 1. What are the tax collectors and the sinners doing? They're gathering around the beach. Okay, so let's, let's focus right into one thing. What is it that they're doing then? They're gathering. So, okay, ga uh, listening. what's the purpose of the gathering? <laughs> they're listening. They're li so it's not just listening. They're gathering together to what? Hear. To hear Him. Mm. In your, in, so in your translation, it's the NIV, is it? Yeah. Does it, it say says, listen? No, it says hear. To hear, okay. Sorry. So there's a difference There's a difference between hearing and listening, isn't there? Yeah. You can hear somebody and not listen to them. Exactly. Um, now, when it says hear in this situation, it's coming from the Hebrew concept, and we've seen it before. What is the word in Hebrew? Shema. Shema. So they have gathered together... To Shema. And this comes from what passage that's most famously uh, related to this word? So Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. And it's referred to, it's actually called the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai. It's Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And it's to hear Shema is to hear with the intent or the purpose of obeying. It's not just, I heard something or I heard a voice. Um, it's a, an intent to hear, listening, to understand, and obey, to put it into practice. Now, this doesn't, this is, Luke doesn't just write this to us just out of the blue. Remember, when we read the Scriptures, it always has to be in context. So we need to understand the context. We've, we can read the parable of what's known as or referred to often as the prodigal son. We can read about that and, and be uh, instructed regarding it. But if we're not looking at it in context, we're going to miss the purpose and the intent of why Jesus spoke this particular parable and the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. So what is the context? Luke says that they're gathered together to Shema, Jesus. Now, go back 
one verse. Chapter divisions are good because they help us to identify where we are. So when I say we're in Luke 15 tonight, Luke 15 verse 1, it's easy for you to turn and look and find that passage. Uh, but sometimes, more often than, than we'd like it to, chapter divisions and verse divisions can tend to say, okay, I've finished chapter 14 and, and verse 30, what is it, 35? And uh, so I've finished that. Now chapter 15 begins a new thought or begins a new whatever, episode or teaching. It's not always the case. What is the last thing that Luke records for us that Jesus speaks the very last sentence before we read about these sinners and tax collectors gathering together? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So he who has ears to shema, let him shema. Right? There's a context here. Jesus is teaching, and he is he's talking, he's been talking to them about the cost of discipleship most recently. And then he's saying, He who has ears to Shema, let him Shema. Who has ears to Shema? Everybody does. But it doesn't automatically happen. That's why he says, then let him Shema. Because what comes after Shema, Yisrael, Adonai, Echad, Adonai, um, oh, I've lost it now. Shema, Yisrael, Adonai, Eloheinu, Adonai, Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What comes next? Right, so you shall love the Lord your God with all that you are. So when Jesus says, he who has ears to Shema, they are not hearing that without automatically hearing Shema Yisrael, Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. They're hearing that, and that automatically brings them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and your strength. And so who do we hear is doing that very thing? The tax collectors and the sinners are coming together not out of curiosity and not just, oh, what's going on over there? They are coming together to Shema. They're coming together to do the very thing that Jesus said, whoever has ears to Shema, let him Shema. Who, is, who are the ones who are Shema'im? <laughs> Anglicizing, <laughs> Anglicizing the Hebrew word. <laughs> You've heard of franglais? Well, uh, that, that's... that's Hebrewish. <laughs> it's the tax collectors and the sinners. And who's upset about it? The Pharisees and the scribes. It's a big deal. And Jesus, then we see in verse 3, what did we read? And Jesus told them this parable. Now we look at it and say, okay, he told them a parable about a lost sheep, one out of a hundred. And then he goes on and tells them another parable, a parable of a lost coin. And then he goes on and tells another parable, the parable of the lost son. But no, he tells them this parable, and the parable has three acts. It has three scenes in it, if you will. It deals with a lost sheep, and it deals with a lost coin. And they set the stage for understanding the parable of the lost sons. Remember last week I said it's the parable of the lost, and I said it's the parable of the lost what? And the response was the lost son. But it's the parable of the lost sons, plural. And it's more about the older brother than it is about the younger brother. Because who is he speaking this to in response to an, to an attitude and thoughts? He's speaking this parable to the Pharisees. Now, everybody else is hearing it, but it's directed to the Pharisees. That makes an impact for us to be able to understand what Jesus is saying here. All right, have a look at this. This parable. In the first parable... Whoops. In the first parable... We have one 
out of 100 sheep. And where was it lost? It was lost in the open country. So basically, it was lost going away. Then we have one in 10 coins. It's uh, lost, so I should say, we'll put lost here. Lost going away. This one was lost where? In the house, at home. So Jesus sets up these two uh, scenes, if you will, concepts, so that it sets the stage for what he's about to tell them as it's going to really drive the, the point home. So when he speaks about the younger son, he's lost where? Going away. Going away. The older son is lost where? At home. At home. And who's the older son represent? Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees, yes. Okay. And the younger son represents? Tax collectors, the sinners. All right. So, and, and so that takes in everybody, right? The, the, these are the two camps. You've got the ones who um, they're sinning against God because of the wrong they're doing, the immoral things. And you've got the ones who are disobeying God, rebelling against him by the moral things that they are doing. Well, they're doing moral things. They're doing good things. But they're not doing them in a relationship with God. So you can do moral things and not be a Christian, right? You can give to the poor. You can, you can feed the sick. You, you can build hospitals, you can, you can do all sorts of things that are moral things. You can tell the truth is a moral thing and not be a Christian. The good works. Good works. It's all about, for them, it's all about the good works. All right, so for the Pharisees, let's just get an idea of their attitude towards sinners and tax collectors. Um, so in the oral law, Pharisees must neither buy from nor sell to a publican, tax collector, or a sinner, anything that is in a dry or a fluid state. So if you've got a marketplace and you've got uh, sinners there according to their interpretation, meaning those that are the low of the low of sinners, then you are not to buy or sell. You're not to in interact with, with, uh, with them in, in exchange of goods. A Pharisee was not to eat at a sinner's table and thus partake of something that might not have been tithed first. He was not to admit a tax collector or a sinner to his table unless they put on the clothes of a Pharisee, meaning that they converted to Pharisaism, accepted all of their teachings, all right? The Pharisee must never perform anything in the presence of a sinner that was con connected with the laws of purification, <laughs> lest the sinner himself should be convicted and want to be purified. Finally, they taught that there was joy before God when those who provoked him perished from the earth and that God rejoiced over the death of sinners. That was the belief of the Pharisees. Now, they were all good if there was a, a, these tax collectors and sinners became converts, but they had to be all in to Phariseeism. But what does Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11 tell us about God and his attitude with the death of the wicked? He does not take pleasure in death. He takes no delight, no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the Pharisee said, ha ha, he's there rubbing his hands, like, yeah, finally. All right, now you're in my domain and we're going to have some words and you're not going to like them. Pharisees weren't very nice people, basically. They weren't fair, you see. They weren't fair, you see. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> All right. Let's... Let's get into the...
continuation of this parable. So we dealt with the first two aspects of the parable. Parable of the, of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And in both of those instances, Jesus asks a question. But there's no question asked, at least not directly, with the, with the aspect with the two lost sons. Look at when Jesus starts here. How does he start the first act? In verse 4, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Question mark. So he says, you all know what this is like. If you were, if you were in this position, you would do this very thing. Then down in verse 8, or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? Question. He knows that they're all in agreement with this. Yes, of course you would do that very thing. And Jesus' point is it, at the beginning here is that you, you're concerned about sheep, you're concerned about coins, how much more important are people? And then he makes a comment that's repeated in both of these two, first two um, episodes, where he says that when they have found what they've been looking for, what do they do? They gather people together and they say what? I've lost that which was, was, I have found that which was lost, and celebrate, rejoice with me, this is good. And then, what do we see in verse 7? There's more joy in heaven about one who one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then we come down into the middle part of verse 9 when she finds the coin, gathers everybody together and says what? Rejoice. Rejoice. Oh, excuse me, and it's verse 10. Um, so verse 10 says, just so I tell you, there is rejoicing. rejoicing before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus is saying, all right, you need a perspective adjustment. And then he takes the two of those concepts and he weaves them into probably the most complex story ever told. I mean, a short story. Because the most complex story ever told is between the covers of this book. So that's the most complex. But a story that's just told um, in, this, in the concept of what we're looking at right here. Somebody tells a story. This is the most complex story told just on the spot. 388 words. But the complexity of it is so intricate, yet the simplicity that anyone can hear it and understand it is, it's mind-boggling. So how is it, in what way is it complex? Anybody know? There's a lot of Jewish cultural stuff in it that you wouldn't get if you didn't. Okay, a lot of Jewish cultural stuff in it. And what are they? Any ideas? Any pictures? Well, like the father running when the son comes home, and the father giving the inheritance in the first place was just totally taboo. And then okay. Ridiculous. And so, in that culture, that was just so round upon. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, why don't we um, take this a bit at a time? Because if we were to read it all and then come back to it, then we're going to lose the continuity as we get to the latter parts of it. And then it's like, okay, so we're going to take it a section at a time. Let's look at verse 11 down to 16. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his pro property in reckless living. 
And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him in the, into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. A man and two sons, keep that in mind. We're going to see that again and why Jesus is looking not just at two sons as they reflect these two uh, groups of people, but as he's gleaning this from the Hebrew scriptures. And so as has already been indicated, these two sons, younger and the older, and the younger one decides that he wants to have his share of the inheritance. His share of the inheritance would be this. Because there's two children, the older son would get a double portion of, the, of everybody else. So if there were, uh, say, four children, then he would get half of the inheritance, and the remainder of that half would be divided between the other three. That makes sense? So he would get double of everybody else. So in this case, he's getting double what the younger son would, that's what he's entitled to. But when this younger son wants his share of the what? Property, the inheritance. This is a big deal because Property was not meant to change hands for it to be sold into the hands of strangers. It was to be kept in the family. Leviticus chapter uh, 20, 25 speaks of this. Or 20, Leviticus chapter chapter 25 it speaks about this in the return of of land so think about Ruth and, and Naomi for a moment when Naomi and her family Elimelech and their two sons left Bethlehem they went to the land of Moab they were there for 10 years they came back and Naomi comes back after her husband and two sons both die they have married in the land of Moab so now she has two daughters-in-law, and they're going to return, but one of the two says, I will turn back after Naomi released her, Orpah. But Ruth comes back with her, and we discover that the, the land that they had once owned has been taken over by others while they were absent, and so they're looking for a kinsman redeemer, and that's who Boaz fills the position with a close relative who can redeem the land and bring it back into the family. And so that's what Boaz ends up doing. Leviticus 25 speaks about that regarding the year of Jubilee, that land is to be returned to the original owners. It's not to be sold into the hands of strangers and so on. All right, so uh, for this young man, to ask his father for his share of the property is one, basically, there's only one time that inheritance are, are handed out, and when is that? Death. After, Death. after dad dies. So essentially, what is he saying here? Dad, I wish you were dead. dead. Not in so many words, but he says, you know what? It's, it's as though uh, you're dead to me because I'm not really interested in the relationship. I just want what you have. What's coming to me, I want it. So this is where he is at. However, how does he address his dad? Look at verse uh, 12. How does he address his dad? Father. Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. That's going to be important because when we look at the older son, he will not address his dad as father. He has disdain for his dad. So we'll, we'll take a look at that when we arrive there. So the younger son the, well, is, is um, given 
a piece of the property, so he's given, in this case, one-third of the property, right? The land is divided. So his older brother is going to get twice as much, two-thirds. So he's getting one-third of the property. Well, have a look at what he does. He says, not many days later, the young man gathered all he had. Well, you can't gather all you have if what you have is tied up in the land. So what did he have to do in order to gather up all he had? He put up a, he put up a real estate sign for sale, and he sold it to somebody. He takes what he has, and because he's selling it so quickly, it's quite likely that he takes a loss on it, but nevertheless, he's got a good sum of money. And he goes about now, and he squanders, he wastes his property. It's interesting that um, when G after Jesus addresses the Pharisees here, and his topic of uh, in, of concern is that the son, younger son wastes his property, his possessions. When he turns to his disciples in chapter 16 and verse 1, remember context, as though chapter 16, the, the number doesn't exist. Then he turns to his disciples and speaks about there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was what? Wasting his possessions. It's interesting that Jesus carries um, a concept, a thought through as now he turns his attention to his disciples after he deals with the Pharisees. Well, we're not going to deal with that right at the moment. It's just something for you to have in mind that, that Jesus, he is alert, he's aware, he's involved, he's, um, he's concerned, he's invested in our lives. And he doesn't miss anything. All right, so he's, he's squandering, he's, he's wasting his money. And then we see that uh, while he's there, he, everything is spent. And then what happens? After everything's gone, it's not, it's not as though it's bad enough, but now it's going to get worse. Money's gone, property, all his inheritance is shot. And on top of that, to make matters worse, there's a what? Family. Now keep in mind, we're not just looking at a story here. Imagine you don't know this story. How many of you have heard this story before? So we all know how it ends, right? We know the details, at least generally speaking, of what this story is about. But when Jesus speaks this to the Pharisees, they've never heard this story before. This is a brand new story that Jesus uh, weaves on the spot. So they don't know where it's going. They don't know how it's going to end. So when they, when, when they hear about this father has two sons, okay, okay, picturing that, Jesus is setting the stage for them. His two sons. And the younger son, is uh, he wants his share of the property. He wants the inheritance now. So for the Pharisees and the rest of the, of the people in that crowd, they're thinking, what? Well, we know what's going to happen now. The father, he's going to, he's going to slap him across the face and tell him to leave. And there will be a, a great lengthy period of time before he's received back uh, after the, the son makes amends and makes a public apology and, and a great deal of... Uh, of many things that they would be putting in their mind if that was my son. Do you get the idea here? They are, they are being drawn in emotionally because they are connected to this kind of concept. Then they're shocked out of their tree when Jesus says, and the Father agreed to do so. Like, it'd be one thing for a father to decide on his own, I would like to do this before I die. That's one thing. And that would be like, eh, okay, well, that's not what I would do, but okay. But in this instance, this is scandalous. Then he, the, the younger son takes his goods and he goes where? A far country. What does that speak of? The near country would be referring to where? Israel. 
far country would be referring to? For the Gentiles are. Gentiles. All right, keep in mind far country. Come back to that in a moment. It's not much wonder there's famine that comes to this far country because it's a Gentile country. And we know that Gentiles are not God-fearers and because of that, there's gonna be famines that come upon the land and they even knew what famines were in their own land when they disobeyed God, All right? So they have that through their history. That was part of the promise that God had made uh, to the people of Israel uh, through Moses that when they come into the land, if they observe the commands, the, the, the law of this covenant, then they, they would not fail to have their crops grow, the, the rains fall in their season, their, their flocks would not miscarry, neither would their wives. But if you, if you reject this word, then all of these things will come against you. So they knew with this idea of famine, this is a big deal. Jesus says a famine comes and they're like, good, he deserves it. Of course, he deserves it. And while he's there, he's so hungry that he takes a job with one of the citizens of that country. And the man owns pigs. Well, for a Jew, there could be no lower calling. I mean, better to be a tax collector than a pig farmer, right? And for the, for the people in this audience and knowing that Jesus, knowing that his audience specifically is directed to the Pharisees and the scribes who are like the, the most pious, pompous, uh, self-righteous in the group, that they're being pretty smug at this point. Okay, well, it was shocking when the father did, when he did this to the dad, when the dad did that for the son, and now he's getting what he deserves. But while he's there, He's starving. Almost to what? Starving almost to death. He's so hungry that he's, he's even thinking about eating the pods that the pigs are eating. And that's, it's bad enough you're looking after pigs, but when you start hungering after the very food that these unclean, despicable animals are eating, as far as the Jews are concerned, but you, you've not reached any further, any, any lower than what this young man is right now. But nobody gave him anything. It's a pretty big deal. Nobody gave him anything. And they're probably thinking, <laughs> and if he was coming looking to me for something, he would be getting less than that too. Let's pick it up, verse 17. Let's go down to verse 24. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatty calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. He starts thinking, you know what? The hired hands, the hired servants in my father's house have a better off than I do. They have more bread and they know what to do with it. I know what I'll do. I'll go and tell him, make me use one of your, what? Service is service. What kind of servant? Hired servant. This is different than a regular servant. Because a hired servant 
didn't live in the household. A hired servant lived in the community and came to work for the one who was hired. So this isn't one, so a, a slave in the household would have even greater privilege in a sense because they're under the household of the father, the master, than a hired servant. They're just, they come and go, I'll be courteous to them, I will take care of, uh, I'll look after their breaks and I'll give them lots of food to eat, but, and I'll give them a wage and they go back and they take care of their own families. So I'll go and I'll ask if, if I can be a hired servant. What is he saying? In a sense, he's saying, let me, you select whoever it is that you desire, who you choose, and I will apprentice under them so that I can learn a trade because up to this point, he hasn't needed to learn a trade because everything's been taken care of. So tell me, you select whoever it is and I will apprentice under them so that I can earn some money and I can pay you back. So this is his mindset, okay? He makes his way back to his father's house. Yet while he's still a long way off, what happens? Father sees him and he runs to him. That means he has to lift the hem of his robe it was not dignified for a patriarch, an, an adult man, to run. It was dishonorable. So when Jesus says this man ran, this is another scandalous thing that the audience is hearing, and the Pharisees and the scribes. Pharisees and scribes, if they're upset at the tax collectors and the sinners, then he, they're really not happy about this young son, and they're not happy about this father because neither of them are models of society and ph Phariseeism. Yeah, what does this father do when he arrives? Because the, the son, he's got this rehearsed in his head and what he's going to tell him. So what does he do? His father sees him, he, he has compassion, not that he's running because he's mad and finally I can get some. He has compassion on him and he runs. So this is a very big deal, a very big, uh, a very key point in, in this story that he has compassion. And this is another scandalous thing that the audience is hearing. What do you mean compassion? What do you mean he's running? Then there's more scandalous things that are going to take place because when he, when he gets to his son, what does he do? He embraces him and kisses him. And not only that, as he's running, guess who's running behind the father? The servants. They're like, where's he going? I don't know. And then they say, I see somebody running, coming this way. But they're not running. They're, they, is that the younger son? Whoa. And he's, ah, this is going to be good. Oh. But when they arrive, they're slowing down because... The father of the house has gotten to him first, and in spite of his appearance and his, his lack of hygiene and the stench of pigs upon him, what does the father do? Embraces him, and in so doing, what has he done before that? What has he done by embracing him? He's covered him so that he's covered his shame and disgrace and he's taken it upon himself. And then he kisses him. And not just kisses him as in just a little uh, on the cheek, but he's kissing him on the neck and the cheek and the head and, and just, my son, my son. And then once this, this embrace and reunion has, has subsided enough for the father to, to regain his composure, See, the son, he's, he's got it all rehearsed in his mind. And what does he say? The father says to him, or the son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer to be called your, your son. But before he has a chance to say anything more than that, what does the dad say? He's hearing what he's saying, but he's, <laughs> you know what? That you came back is a sign of your heart. So he turns to his servants and says, quick, Go! Notice, he says what? Quick! 
Bring the best robe. Bring the best robe. Bring a ring, the family ring, the signet ring, and as my authority, bring the uh, shoes for his feet and kill the fatted calf. Why? Because this son, say it loud. Why though? This son was what? Was dead. This son was lost and now he's found. He was dead and is now alive. And they began to celebrate. It's an amazing picture of the lavish grace of God. This is, this is the picture that Jesus is giving. See, we, we have heard about the, the, the wastefulness of this younger son. But what is looking at, they're, they're first of all looking in the story, yeah, this younger son, what, what wastefulness. But then they're looking at the father and what he's doing now, and they're, they've forgotten about the wastefulness of the younger son. Now they're saying, what a waste this father is. He's given him the best robe. He's given him the family signet ring and he's given him shoes on his feet. That means he's bringing him back under full acceptance and full rights and privileges of the family as a son. He doesn't deserve it. This father is a, he's a reproach to Judaism. He's a reproach to, to Phariseeism. He's a, reproach, he's a reproach to mankind. I mean, come on. Who in the right man mind would do this? How, what wasteful spending. That's their minds. But Jesus is giving a picture here of God. And we can't, we really can't get over it. This fatted calf, meat was not a regular part of their diet. And especially not the fatted calf. And the fatted calf was meant for very dignified, very important uh, people that would be honored in the community or dignitaries. It's a delicacy. But in doing all of this, it's speaking of the freeness and extravagance of God's grace. So this young man, he's, he's not given a chance by his dad to say, make me as one of your hired servants. I gotta pay you back. Dad's saying, I've taken care of it all. Debt is paid in full. It's erased. Incredible. Incredible. I mean, church, this is what God has done for us. <laughs> Verse 17, he sees that they have more than enough bread. See, he knows they have more than enough bread, but he's about to learn that there's more than enough grace. And for anyone else in a similar situation. So Jesus is likening this young man to the sinners and tax collectors. They are Shema, the Lord. They're hearing his words. And they're responding, do they deserve it? No. no. But does anyone deserve it? No. Verse 25, let's take that to, to the end. Luke 15. 32? Oh, sorry, yeah, 32. 25? 25 to 32, darling. Okay. Meanwhile, the older man, I uh, know, uh, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother came home, he replied, and your father has killed the fat calf because he has come back safe and sound. The older brother was very angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, I have 
I look all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends okay. <laughs> sorry no problem <laughs> Uh, verse 30. I'm way over here. One of those double no. flips of the page, was it? So I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we have to celebrate and be glad because the brother of, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He has, he was lost and is now found. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right, so we've got the young son, and uh, he dishonors the father, and really he exhibits no interest in his dad, any relationship. He wants his father's possessions, but he doesn't want relationship. Well, here we have now the older brother, and he's out in the field indicating that he's busy working. You know, he's doing what he ought to be doing, working hard. But then he learns as he's, um, as he's coming near to the house, Hears music and dancing. He's not sure what's going on. So he called one of the servants who is probably outside preparing, not just standing or sitting around, but they're involved with whatever it is that they're doing to help look after getting more drink or more food or whatever provisions or things that they would be tasked with. He'd be saying, hey, hey, uh, Yochanan, come here. Tell me, what's going, what's going on inside? And so... He's told and he learns that your brother has come home. Your father's killed the fatted calf. So he learns that son, his brother's come home. Before he hears anything more, he's like, what? He's come home and he's in the house? Dad has let him in the house? And he's, you, what did you say about the fatted calf? He did what? This is for my brother? That no good, low life scum? Well, what does he do? He's angry, he's furious, and he refuses to go inside, thereby dishonoring, he was dishonoring his father. He refused to go into that which his father decreed, saw fit to be carried out in the house for the household and for the community. It wasn't just the servants and all that were invited. This would be a, a, an entire town celebration. Come, it's like one of my sheep was lost. I found it and brought everybody together. Rejoice. But he refused to go in. So what happens? His father comes out. But his father doesn't come out and scold him, does he? So his father goes out and bids him to come in. Come, come, son. But he answered his father and said, what did he say? So what's his word? Look, you can just hear the venom in his voice. Look. He doesn't say father, does he? No. The younger son at least had enough presence of mind to address him as father. But he says, look, these many years I served you and I never disobeyed your command. See, he's looking at that his father owes him for what he has done, for his obedience, for his morality, for I've done all this and for what? This is what I get? For what? He doesn't care about the father. He only cares about what he can get as well from the father. 
And, and this is all about his standing in the house, his standing in the community. This is why it's a picture of the Pharisees and the scribes. They don't care about God. They use God to their own end. Then he says, you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. He doesn't even say, you never gave me a young goat so that I can celebrate with you. It's all about himself. He tells him everything I have is yours. But he says, but when what? Not when my brother comes home, but when this son of yours comes home. After he has done what? He devoured your property with... Well, where does he come up with that? He hasn't talked with anybody. His brother hasn't told him what he's been doing and where he's been. So he invents this idea that he spent all his money on prostitutes, which gives an indication of his own heart. And that you kill a fatted calf for him after he does this, he imagines the worst about his brother. He said to him, son, you're always with me. Everything that I have is yours. It was necessary. It was fitting to celebrate because this, and be glad because this, your brother, not this brother of yours, because that's more generic, but this, your brother, was dead and he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. See, in verse 30, when the, when the, young, the older son, this son of yours comes and he's saying this, look, he, he did this with your property and now you've done this to honor him. It, it was really a, a, a vehement accusation of injustice. And he doesn't even have the decency to address his father as father. And he publicly insults his father in the hearing of whoever is around or within earshot. But the father says, I still want you in the feast. This will be a feast not just about your brother, but our family. He said, really, I'm not going to disown your brother, but I don't want to disown you either. So what is he telling the brother, to his older son to do? Swallow your pride, come into the feast. And then the story's done. Parable ends. No, res no resolution, what, what, did the, what did he do? We're not told what he did. Why? Because this, it, we'll say again? It was up to the Pharisees. So this is an invitation to the Pharisees. Come in to the feast. Celebrate, come, Shema. Hear these words of mine, because my words are life. Come and celebrate, because these, your brothers, were dead, and now they're alive. They were lost, and now they're found. Come and celebrate. This is a really big deal, is what he's saying to the older brother. Why won't the older brother go in? He says, because I never disobeyed you. Never disobeyed your commands. See, he's not losing his father's love in spite of his goodness, but because of his goodness. His own perceived goodness, that is, the brothers. He's got pride in his moral record, and he was obeying to get. And he's basically saying, now you have to do things my way, the way I want them to be done because you owe me. But he doesn't owe him anything. And the goodness of the father towards the older son, it's just as undeserving as the younger son received. In Matthew 21 and verse 31, we go there for a moment. Matthew 21 and 31.
Let's look at the, at the second portion of that where Jesus, Jesus said to them, and we're at Melissa. The second part of 31? Yes, please. Uh, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. And this is what's been taking place. Tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. We looked at a couple of things. We mentioned a couple of things here regarding uh, two sons, far country, quick, and there's a number of other things that I didn't mention at the time. Uh, but I want you to consider just a few things here. That Jesus is taking a, a number of details from the Hebrew scriptures, and he knows them better than anyone. Why? He is often. <laughs> <laughs> he spoke them, <laughs> right? <laughs> He is the Word made flesh, and He dwelt among us. So there were two sons. Think of two sons in the Old Testament. Think of two sons in the Torah, first five books of the Bible. Think of two sons in Genesis. So I just I narrowed it down. So two sons. Think of two sons. Name, name me two sons. Uh, Jacob and Esau. Cain and Abel. Jacob and Esau. Uh, Ishmael and... Uh, Ish Ishmael and Isaac. Very good. Let's look at, at uh, Jacob and Esau for a moment. Two sons. What, does, what did Jacob do regarding an inheritance? Jacob cheated Esau out of his inheritance, didn't he? When they're hearing this story, they're not catching it all because they don't have a mind to do so. I mean, they had the knowledge, the awareness of the scriptures that they could have done so, but they've got blinders on. And you only see straight ahead, and all they can see is the oral law. But Jesus is weaving details into this story that is so complex from the, from the scriptures. So Jacob and Esau, there were two sons. Jacob cheats the younger cheats the older out of his inheritance. So the older son in this parable, he's thinking, this is, this is ridiculous. So this is, all right, so he sees that. What happens to Jacob after he then deceives his father, um, Isaac, by bringing in uh, a meal and he's, he get, get, gains the birthright, then he, what? Esau is so mad he wants to kill him. He goes away. He runs away to a? Far country. Far country to? Padan Haram, or Padan Aram. Let's bring that up on the slide there for a moment if we can. So Jacob goes to Padan Aram in Haran. Haran is in Padan Aram. So you see the, uh, the top of that red line, just give that right there. So the top of the red line is where uh, Haran is. Remember in Genesis chapter 12 that Abram had left Ur of the Chaldeans, arrives in Haran, and then after his father Terah dies, then the Lord says, now go the, to the land which I had spoken to you. And so he does. Well, Jacob, he goes back to the land of his grandfather because his dad, Isaac, says, don't take a wife from among the Canaanites, but go back to your sister or your mother's brother's home. Take a wife from there. Let's uh, go to the next slide for a second. So you can see the larger picture here of uh, the region. So if you come right down that line to the right, all the way down to the right, to the right, the other right, the other, the other right, the, the, the right, over there. Follow that line, bring it down, bring it down, 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 down. Right there, right there. That's Ur. That's Ur of the Chaldeans. That's where Abraham, Abram, lived originally. And then they came up to Haran, so the peak at the top there, Haran, and then they came to the land of Canaan. All right, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
So that's where they've been. Um, let's, we'll just have a look at this for a second as well. This gives an up close of uh, Aram Nahim. Is it? Is that what it's called? My uh, Aram Neharim, which is in the same area of Padan Aram. And so you see the red dot is Haran. This is where they had come to. So I bring that up just to make reference to it in just a, a moment as we bring this to a close and wrap, uh, wrap this up with a bow with a few further details. He goes to a far country, but what before he goes to a far country, what do we see? Uh, Esau is a man of the field, back in Genesis chapter 25, when we first are introduced to these two young men when they grow up. Genesis 25 and verse 27. I'm just going to give these references out. We're not going to. We're just going to make um, reference to them. But I encourage you to go and, and check them out for yourself. Okay, so that you're not taking my word for it. So Esau is a man of the field. He's the older brother. In Jesus' parable, the older brother, he's out where? In the field. It's the field that he now owns. So Esau is a man of the field. And um, he, he comes starving. He's famished unto death. He's dying of hunger. And he comes to the younger brother. It's a contrast to Jesus' story, right? Because the younger brother, he is starving. He's dying of hunger. He comes to his senses. Uh, the older brother in Jesus' account, he's what? He's angry. He's furious. And with Esau, after Jacob cheats him out of the birth, out of the inheritance, the blessing. So he already given him the birthright, but now he cheats him out of the blessing as well. And this is when Isaac had said, Esau, go and kill a, a, a deer and bring it back, repair it the way you know that I like it, and then I will bless you. Well, Rebecca hears about this and doesn't want Esau to get the blessing. And so tells Jacob, go and prepare one of the goats. Is there a goat? It's a goat. Is there a goat in our story? You didn't even, you didn't even kill a goat. You didn't even give me a goat. So you see the parallels here? Elements that Jesus is weaving into his story. Two goats is what Rebecca said, get two goats. One I'll prepare, the other one I'm going to use and skin it, and, and that will be used. I'm going to put them on your arms and on your back of your neck, because Esau was a very hairy man. If you're that hairy that a, a goat, <laughs> goat hair can pass for your hair, you are a hairy man. It's interesting that Rebecca said to Jacob, and go get one of Esau's, get his best robe. Get Esau's best robe. I think the picture of this best robe that Jesus is speaking about, the Father says, go get the best robe. Whose robe is he speaking about? The sons. And I think the picture here is Jesus is that son, the older brother. Not the older brother that's upset, but the, capital T, H-E, the older brother, our brother. The expense of God's lavish grace. Go get Esau, the older brother's best robe, garments. And uh, he does it. Esau is furious with Jacob. He wants to kill him. The amazing thing is, is that in Genesis 33 and verse 4, after Jacob had been away for 20 years, he comes back, and when Esau encounters him, what does he do? He embraces him and kisses him. Isn't that an amazing picture? It's the only, uh, bring, bring the next slide up on the screen for a sec. It's, you just do it once because there's going to be another um, thing that I want us to see. Not yet. Oh, you can do that. That's fine. Yeah. What's the next slide? 
Uh, yeah, that's the one I want up there. All right, do you see what is, is up there and the arrow that is pointing to that word that is listed? The word in the Hebrew is from Genesis 33 and verse 4. And it's, it says, Ve shnuk eru. And it means, and he kissed him. But it's interesting. Why do I bring that up? Because there's 15 times in the Torah, first five books of the Old Testament, that only 15 times that there are specific dots on top of a word that don't usually appear there that the scribes would have been familiar with. And of those only 15 times, one of those times is right here. Just click it again. And he kissed him is the phrase. And then do it again. And you see the dots that are over that word? Over Veshukeu. He kissed him. The scribes would have copied this hundreds of times before. And when they hear, and the father came and embraced him, and he kissed him, they would have, they would have been familiar, the scribes would have, would have been familiar with this phrase right here. And it would have been a trigger. Because what does what is Esau doing? He's cheated. He's been cheated out of, out of his inherit, his birthright, his inheritance, and he's been cheated out of his blessing. But what has God done in Esau's life? He's changed his heart because he was waiting around until his dad died so he could kill his brother. But he wasn't going to do it while his dad was alive. But somewhere before they, they are brought face to face again, God does a work in Esau's life, and Esau forgave Jacob. If the older brother here, he doesn't have it in him to even refer to him as his brother, your son. Look what your son did. He's dead to me. There's still opportunity, though, for God to do a work in the Pharisees' hearts if they respond to his invitation, come into the feast. In Genesis 27, 1, we find out that Isaac's eyes are dim. He can't see. So he can't see near, he can't see far. But the father in Luke 15, while he's still a long ways off, he sees him. And his heart is filled with compassion and he runs to bring him back home. You've got a picture here of Jacob and Laban. There's music and dancing here. Laban speaks about music and dancing. There's parallels in chapter 31 of Genesis with Laban and Jacob. We won't take time to get into all of it because time doesn't permit us. But there's also Joseph is a picture in this. Genesis 41 and verse 42. It's the only other place in the Bible where somebody gets a ring and a robe when they've gone from rags to riches. Joseph, he's gone from the prison, from the dungeon, and now what does Pharaoh say after he's interpreted the dreams? Get, a, get, a, get the ring and put it on his finger, get the best robes, put it on. There's a great famine. Jacob or Joseph also found himself in a far country. God does a work in his life. And he was thought to be dead. And he's reunited with his father. There's the element of forgiveness where Joseph forgave his brothers. And he also embraced them and kissed them. See how Jesus, he's not just telling this story out of the blue, he's, he's taking what they know as to be the, the scriptures and, and their history, their ancestry. And those who were wrong, they're, they're calling on the, the grace of God and they're forgiving and kissing and, and receiving back once again. You got a picture of in the middle of the Joseph story, there's a picture there given to us regarding Judah and Tamar. It's a story about a friend, a goat, a prostitute. 
The older brother condemns the younger son for sexual sin, where in the, Ju in the Judah and Tamar story, he condemns Tamar for playing the, the part of a prostitute. Yet he was the one guilty. And there was also the, the signet ring that was there, the cord, the signet cord, the goat. Contrast, where Joseph was in a distant country and he resisted sexual temptation. Judah is in the land of Canaan and he gave in to sexual temptation. Get a picture of Abraham, where he is the first time you see the word quick in the Old Testament. First time. Quick, go and gather three seas of flour to Sarah, and then says, go to his servants, go and prepare the fatted calf. First time you see a fatted calf that is given. First time the hospitality is being spoken about. First time somebody running, he ran and prepared these things. And he's the only father to recorded to have given an inheritance while he was still alive. In Genesis chapter 25, verses five and six says, and he gave his inheritance to Isaac. Ishmael didn't get any of the inheritance. And by this time he had had a couple of other sons by after Sarah had died. And he wouldn't allow his son to go to a far country to get a wife. We find out that his chief servant went to the land of, I'm sorry, online viewers, I left that up for you. Just one sec, I can get it back. If I can get my mouse to behave. I'm sorry about that. We will have to do it the old fashioned way. and it's not gonna to respond to me. All right, that's the way it's gonna to have to be. I, ex I apologize for that. Um, I was saying, oh, I wouldn't allow him to go into a far country to get a wife. Or he went to a far country to get a wife, wouldn't allow him to take one from the Canaanites, and went back to the land of Haran. And lastly, we have Cain and Abel, which is really firstly because they're the first two sons. At least the first two sons that Adam and Eve had. And we find out a couple of things regarding them. It's the first family conflict between the two sons. We're told the older was in the field and the younger was taking care of sheep, animals. Sheep are very similar to goats, right? And Cain became very angry because Abel was accepted by God. First recorded um, account of anger is because of envy of an older son, an older brother against his younger brother. And God warned. He engages graciously with the older, angry older brother and tells him, to respond or else sin is crouching at the door ready to take you. And then lastly, really this is the, the, one of the thrusts that Jesus is leaving them with and that we'll be left with tonight. In Genesis 4 and verse 9, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? And really Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the scribes, you are your brother's keeper, so look out for the younger son. Work to bring them into the grace of God. And they would come to know the grace of God, but they can't do that until they themselves first experience firsthand the grace of God. It's there for them, but they haven't yet responded or received it. How awesome is the grace of God? How lavish and expensive that the world looks at and says it's foolish and wasteful but we look at it and say it is priceless and precious. Wow. 